corporate capitalism will quite literally kill us. That's what our guest tonight argues in his latest book by traveling to and documenting life and the destruction of it in so-called sacrifice zones. Now this includes the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, the city of Camden, New Jersey, the now leveled off mountains of West Virginia and the migrant worker camps that resemble modern day, modern day slavery in Southwest Florida. So why are these sacrifice zones? Well, because both human beings and the natural world have been used, then discarded, all to maximize earnings in a marketplace the rules without constraints. Now, perhaps these are the most shocking in your face examples. They seem like extremes, but should they be used as a warning sign as to where the rest of the country and the world are headed, or can it still be stopped? Joining me to discuss this is Chris Hedges, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and senior fellow at the Nation Institute and author of the new book, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. Chris, thanks for joining us tonight. And, you know, I started there with uh, one of your lines from the book about how corporate capitalism will quite literally kill us. Some people out there might say that that's a little dramatic. Why are they wrong? Well, unfettered, unregulated capitalism is, as Karl Marx understood, a revolutionary force. Uh, it knows no limits. It commodifies everything. Human beings become commodities. The natural world becomes a commodity that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. Uh, and for that reason, once uh, regulations and controls, legal controls are lifted, which is what's happened. Uh, there is built within this force a kind of uh, self-annihilactic quality, and we see that with climate change. Uh, that's why the environmental crisis is intimately twinned with the economic crisis. The only words they know is more, and they serve quarterly profits, and if, if that means they trash the ecosystem on which the human species depends for life, if that means that they hollow out uh, our countries as they are currently to create a global neo-feudalism, a world of masters and serfs, a world where the working class, in order to be competitive, has to be competitive with prison labor in China or sweatshop workers in Bangladesh who, uh, who uh, make 22 cents an hour. That is what, not only what they will do, that is what they are doing. So we went to those places where uh, everything, everybody, uh, the environment, uh, the legal system was made to kneel before the marketplace uh, because that's, they started with them and, and now they're, they're moving on for us. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's really heartbreaking and it's devastating to read about uh, these locations as you went to, but I have a feeling that most Americans probably have no idea what it's like there. They have no idea that it's that bad. Because if you turn on TV, you're watching a reality show, uh, you're just seeing a lot of excess thrown in your face, right? And so, so why is that? Why are these the kind of places that we like to ignore or maybe deliberately hide away? Well, I mean, let's lay this at the feet of where it belongs, and that is a corporatized media system, uh, which is all about generating profit and ratings, uh, not about imparting news. They don't do journalism anymore. Uh, they do news. N news is judged for its uh, entertainment value solely. It's why we have leached into celebrity gossip as a species of news, uh, or the tawdry, or the salacious, or, uh, you know, and, and that, that's true on the left and the right. MSNBC is as guilty of this uh, as Fox News. They are essentially courtiers. They spin court gossip in different directions, but it's the same inanities. It's Mitt Romney's horse, or Tom Cruise's divorce, or Newt Gingrich's moon colonies. It's very hard to keep up. Uh, and those who are rendered uh, destitute, and we're talking now uh, significant portions of the United States uh, now, uh, are invisible. And that's why I did the book with a graphic illustrator, Joe Sacco, uh, who does this long-form journalism and then draws it out in books like Palestine, Safe Area, Garage, to, uh, Footnotes in Gaza, uh, because the goal of the book was not only to tell the stories, but to make these people visible. And at certain points in the book, it actually flips into comic panels, which give a filmic quality uh, to people's life and can show visually the kind of devastation that we reported from. Uh, we are just seeing in the last few weeks this march of unfettered capitalism continue, this assault against the working class, the refusal to uh, extend unemployment benefits for hundreds of thousands of American citizens, which means that many of them will lose their homes, go into bankruptcy. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court decision to uh, severely weaken public sector unions 
uh, the refusal uh, to fund the food stamp program. And remember, remember, one in three children in this country now depend on food stamps to eat. Uh, they, 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 there is nothing left. There is nothing left within the formal mechanisms of power to protect us. And that's why what's happened in these sacrifice zones is so important, because as we reconfigure American society into an oligarchic elite, three or four percent, a managerial elite of about 12 percent, uh, and then the rest of us are hanging on by our fingertips. This, by the way, is how totalitarian societies configure their economies. It's exactly what George Orwell wrote about in 1984, uh, with, with most of the population being termed uh, proles. That's right, that's right. Well, since you brought it up, too, uh, you know, I want to get your take on, on the health care ruling from the Supreme Court. You know, I feel like so quickly the conversation, or maybe it was never even at that level to begin with, uh, but it just seemed like it's digressed to uh, a discussion over semantics and which politician wants to call it a penalty and or a fee or a tax, and we've forgotten about the fact that our health care system is still far from being uh, fixed or, or working properly. Well, look, the, the, the so-called Obamacare, and this is a perfect example, of a sterile and empty debate. Uh, this uh, whole program was cooked up in the Heritage Foundation. Uh, it was first put into practice in 2006 by then Governor Mitt Romney. Uh, they took that Massachusetts plan, the pharmaceutical and insurance lobbyists uh, authored 2,000 pages of the bill, included uh, $447 billion in subsidies for the pharmaceutical and insurance industry, the equivalent of the bank bailout bill for those industries. Uh, they can still raise, well, they are, as anybody who has private insurance, as I do, will tell you, they are jacking up premiums almost monthly uh, they can raise co-payments. There's no protection if you get chronic, uh, a chronic or severe illness. If you can't pay those premiums, you're out. That's why a million people a year in this country go bankrupt. 80% uh, of those people, by the way, had insurance. Uh, and yet, you know, we have this debate uh, that there is no difference between Romney care and Obamacare. Uh, it, it's all a carnival act. It's political theater. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it doesn't matter which piece of legislation you're talking about. Corporations write it. They write the laws. They write the rules. There's a two-tiered system. Uh, there's one system for them, and there's another system for the rest of us. Uh, they are criminalizing dissent, as Glenn Greenwald uh, just uh, laid out. Uh, and uh, they are criminalizing or, or they're legalizing their own criminal activity in fraud. I mean, that's why nobody on Wall Street, except for Bernie Madoff, and that's because he stole from rich people, uh, has gone to jail. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely transparent, and yet we're just awash in this very powerful system of corporate propaganda. I mean, the airwaves are just filled with lies uh, yeah. and, well, and me, skillfully me, done lies. Let me just, you know, for timing's sake, to interrupt you there. I mean, transparent on one sense and, uh, and the fact that I think that we're finally starting to diagnose some of these issues, it's gotten to the point where you can't just ignore it anymore. It's become pretty in your face. But then what's interesting about this, and you write about this too, you bring up Hannah Arendt, is that rather than in the past where you might have uh, a vicious leader, right, or just a dictator, a face that you can put on it, the corporate leadership is not, they, they're faceless, right? These aren't people we know. These right. are an invisible kind of power that's working in the background. And so how do you actually counter something like that? You know, you point to the Occupy movement, you seem pretty hopeful about it, but in order to really, really counter the corporatization of America, do you need a revolution? Well, you need a mass movement. All the correctives to American democracy came about through mass movements, uh, not through, uh, you know, the leaders uh, they were pressured to respond. The last liberal president we had in this country was Richard Nixon, not because he was a liberal, but because he was frightened of movements. There's a great scene in Kissinger's memoirs, please don't go by the book, uh, where the White House is surrounded by buses, huge anti-war demonstration, I think it's 71, and Nixon and Kissinger are standing at the window, and Nixon's going, Henry, Henry, they're going to they're gonna break through the barricades and get us. Well, that's precisely where you want power uh, people in power to be. And our movements were broken in the name of anti-communism, uh, and our liberal class was disemboweled. Uh, we were essentially left defenseless, and that's why I have been a supporter of the Occupy movement, because I think it's only through movements that we're going to regain any kind of power and begin to push back against this system. And if we don't, uh, then we are going to live in what Sheldon Woolen calls uh, a kind of inverted totalitarianism, a kind of corporate fascism, uh, 
uh, which is not classical fascism, partly for the reasons you pointed out, because it's faceless. All right, well, we're going to find out more about what the Occupy movement is actually doing as they gather in Philadelphia next. But in the meantime, Chris, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And a great book. Everyone out there should read it. Thank you.